I was very intrigued by the uh, theme for the session uh, this year um, because it, it started to uh, reflect the reality that we see in our practice and this idea that uh, um, designing icons as standalone architectural objects in cities is no longer working for us and that we really need to think about uh, the buildings more holistically as they kind of relate to the city, as they come down to ground and how there's a possibility that um, the increased kind of density that we're dealing with on some of our sites in the city of Toronto requires us to actually bring some of the public realm and some of the uses and infrastructure that you typically see outside of buildings back in uh, to buildings to accommodate this whole idea of, uh, of density. So it, it's this idea of uh, physically connecting the buildings to the city and actually socially connecting them as well. And uh, the place that we find ourselves typically in Toronto is that uh, we're doing a lot of work for developers. It's a very, very busy city. And in many cases, those buildings are seen as singular objects. They're seen as uh, standalone buildings that are, are starting more and more to try to fit into a fabric, but we're just finding that it's becoming more of an issue for us to explore. So it's a very interesting uh, point in time in our career as architects in the city, and I think in the city in general, as well as worldwide, just hearing some of the things that have been talked about here in the, uh, the sessions. Um, but this idea of the singular object uh, building has, uh, is really starting to transform and we're actually finding that a lot of our projects are getting larger, the sites are getting larger. This idea of a precinct uh, is something that's very familiar to us now as I'm going to be talking about one of the projects that we did which was part of a whole precinct plan at the, uh, the base of Young Street. The projects that you see up, up here now kind of reflect the scale that we're operating at in the City of Toronto. On the left, our one Young Street project is approximately uh, two and a half million uh, square feet of residential plus another million, million and a half of office. Uh, the project in the middle is roughly uh, three million square feet with a million uh, of office and another million and a half of residential and then uh, 500,000 square feet of retail. So there's a, a real complexity to these projects that really require us to think beyond this idea of these buildings just being objects and iconic uh, elements that sit in the skyline. It's really how do these uh, buildings sit within the fabric. So uh, one of the things that we're finding ourselves doing is actually stepping outside of the uh, world of the developer uh, clients that we typically do a lot of work with and we're actually working uh, on several studies with the, uh, the City of Toronto. So we're kind of leaving the public sector, sorry, leaving the private sector, sector to bring some of our experience to bear on the uh, public sector and some of the projects that we're doing. So what I'm going to talk about today are two of these studies. One was the uh, tall building study that we did for the City of Toronto, which started uh, back in 2008 and completed itself in 20, uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, 10, I believe, and then was uh, then taken by the city and developed and refined even more. So one of the things that I talked about in my paper was this idea also that these documents that we're working on with the city are, are kind of living documents, living, living documents in the sense that they will change, they become modified, and they need to respond to uh, the, the kind of changing needs that we see within the city and that the city sees uh, in terms of the projects that they're encountering. So. The tall building guidelines uh, was something that we worked on with the city and with Urban Strategies, an urban design and planning firm in, in Toronto, to help give the city a toolkit uh, as they analyzed the, uh, the number of developments that uh, have come into the city that have uh, reflected, I think, the kind of growth that we've experienced in that city. And it was really focused on how do we create and, and um, uh, vital cities, how do we harness the energy that's uh, created by people coming into the downtowns and how do we create at the same time a livable downtown in the great city. The other report that I was going to talk about today is uh, growing up planning for children in new vertical communities and there is this um, uh, recognition I think in the city of Toronto certainly that more and more families are choosing to live in cities and that they are uh, sacrificing uh, space 
uh, for a better lifestyle in terms of not having to commute for as long, to get from uh, work at, in the city out to the suburbs. So they're saying, we're going to live in the city, we're going to sacrifice the amount of space that we need that we would typically have in a suburban house. But we've got to accommodate uh, our kids, and how do we do that? So. We did a study, and we're, it's an ongoing study, we're still working on this, to, to really look at how families are dealing with this uh, issue of, of living in the city. We looked at three elements of, of uh, uh, the, the, the problem. One was the unit, how are units being, in a way, hacked. This word hacked has uh, been used quite a bit, but the, the, there was this idea of the condo hack that's happening where families are moving into to, to condo units that aren't necessarily designed for families and are having to modify the units to fit their needs. So how can we learn from that process to help design uh, better units for uh, some of these families that make that choice? Also, how can we design better buildings and how can we provide the kind of complexity of uses that we need to uh, within the building to accommodate families in a better way? And then at a larger city scale, how can we design the neighborhood to uh, accommodate families in a better way in a downtown urban setting because for many years this whole aspect of families in the city has been a missed opportunity and it's not something that we've focused on but recognizing that it's a problem I think that uh, it's been an interesting challenge and process for us to work again with urban strategies and the city on uh, this um, uh, study. Ultimately, both uh, studies are intended to form uh, the basis for a whole new approach that the City of Toronto is undertaking, which is called TO Core, which is uh, an idea of how can we make a more livable city uh, for residents and how can we re really consolidate a lot of these different studies that have been undertaken by the city. And um, there's a lot of work that goes on at, at City Hall to try to deal with these issues and how can it be brought to bear into a uh, comprehensive new uh, official plan to help plan the, uh, the city for the future. But one of the key things that they're looking for is this idea of a complete community and how do we build a uh, complete community. So that's part of the thing that we're also focusing on as part of this study. So one of the things that we uh, started to reflect on or to look at was this idea that uh, uh, the, the, the city itself is not just about the building form, as much as we were focused on um, tall building guidelines. It's not just about how that building sits in the context, how, it re how the elements of the buildings relate to each other, the tower positions. It's also about how the kids that are part of these communities and how families can actually uh, take better advantage of some of these spaces and the quality of the city and how can we create a better uh, city for them. A lot of the growth that has been experience in the, uh, in the downtown area has been driven by this idea of the province uh, really controlling growth within the, uh, the downtown area and the growth plan that the prov province has has set a uh, green ring around the, uh, the city and is really focusing growth in areas where infrastructure exists and where we can capitalize on that infrastructure. And it's uh, defined a series of downtown or urban settings rather, uh, centers, and the, uh, the downtown is uh, certainly one of these key centers that we're, we're focusing on. The amount of growth that's taken place has been really significant. Uh, the stats are uh, qu quite interesting. I won't go through all the numbers, but the projected growth uh, from uh, 2011 to 2041 is, is very significant within the downtown area. And this is, again, just focusing on the downtown of the city of Toronto. It's not focusing on the, 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 the whole greater uh, Toronto area. Uh, the downtown reflects a, a large amount of the GDP, the, the percentage of jobs in the area, uh, the tax base is also a significant contributor. So it's, it's, it's seen as an area that will continue to grow and the management of that growth is really important. And uh, the Toronto skyline from 2006 to 2017 as modeled here, this, this reflects the kind of growth that we've seen in the city and the kind of uh, intensification that's happened. So it was quite apparent that uh, tall buildings had to be looked at as, as a way of accommodating the density. And the initial report that we did, uh, working with urban strategies in the city, combined work that had been previously done for the, uh, the greater Toronto area, but focused more on tall buildings in the downtown core. And it did a very 
I think, careful analysis of uh, how to accommodate tall towers in the city. Um, I think I've got a bit of a delay. The way we approached the, uh, the study was to, instead of focusing on every single site in the downtown area, we acknowledged that there had to be a more uh, uh, kind of clear way to do it. So we uh, adopted an approach where we focused on the streets. We defined a whole series of streets as, uh, as are outlined here on the report. Um, the dark blue streets are the, um, the high streets. The light blue are the secondary high streets. And then we also had, um, uh, first tier parks that are identified here and we uh, part of the plan we excluded a lot of areas because they were covered as part of a secondary plan but what we tried to do is look at each one of these streets very carefully to analyze where these streets could accommodate height what the heights could be and uh, how they would be uh, deployed around transit centers so the uh, subway um, uh, intersections which are defined in the black boxes um, on the map are identified as areas that can absorb a bit more height. We've called them height peaks. The color coding reflects the, 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 the different heights. The idea of 137 meters was the height uh, in the downtown area uh, up to unlimited. So the idea was that tall buildings are certainly uh, appropriate in that area. But the other caveat there was that um, shadows cast by those tall buildings that hit any one of these first tier parts, parks would cause us to have to look very carefully at those heights and to possibly bring them down so that there was no net incremental new shadow on adjacent parks. So there was this balancing of public spaces with heights and with position of heights along the streets. We looked at each street carefully and tried to look at where existing towers were deployed and tried to use that as a map to uh, indicate where additional height could start to fill in in some of these sites to, cre to create the map. We also then looked very carefully at the, the, the tower uh, form and the tower floor plates, the size of these floor plates. We looked very carefully also at podium regulations, how, how high should the podiums be, how should they set back and step back, how should different towers uh, relate to each other on a similar site or across from sites. So we've got guidelines that talked about a 25 meter separation between uh, towers to improve livability and sight and uh, access to air and light and views. We also then, as part of the study, and I'm, I'm skipping through a lot of different things because there was a lot of material, but one of the key things was this idea of not shadowing parks, some of the key parks. And so that that was a, a key driver in determining height position as well. The next study, uh, is the, the growing up uh, planning for children in vertical uh, communities. And it was really about going in and trying to understand how families are dealing with this issue. I like the, the middle slide, which kind of shows how people have had to uh, try to accommodate the tight spaces that they're living in by storing their strollers in a bathtub. And part of the idea is how can we make better units and how can we uh, accommodate better situation so that doesn't have to happen, so that it can be built in as part of a guideline to architects that are designing these units to, to think about where do you accommodate things like that within a unit. We also looked at uh, uh, parks and open space, uh, diversity of housing forms, what types of uh, units, what size of units are uh, appropriate. There was a lot of research that was done by visiting families, by talking to developers, by really going and looking at different uh, scenarios. We looked at the entire neighborhood again, this idea of um, how do you design a neighborhood? How do you accommodate parks and open spaces? Uh, how do you provide childcare facilities? How do you uh, accommodate the infrastructure needs of some of these families? How are community centers incorporated into uh, some of these facilities as well? Daycares. Uh, are also a pretty significant piece of the program that we felt had to be a part of the consideration of infrastructure. How parks are accommodated in the area, are there opportunities under the, um, one of the expressways to provide a, a, a park and to, un, to take advantage of underutilized space and to think about how that might be uh, repurposed to actually accommodate families uh, in a downtown setting. 
We also looked at the, um, the, the kind of things that you need to provide to, pro to, to create complete communities. So this idea of retail at the base of towers, the scale of some of that retail in some of these towers, this notion that uh, community centers uh, could and should be co-located within the podiums of some of the buildings and how do you go about doing that and setting up the infrastructure so that works. Um, the, also this idea that uh, thinking about how a, a family would use an, a neighborhood or how a child would go from his unit to use the balcony, to use amenity space within the building, to come down to the street level to get access to parks. So this whole idea of thinking about a whole day in the life of a child and how you can uh, redesign or you need, we need to consider uh, these things as we're designing some of these communities. And, and this idea that uh, this is a complete redevelopment of, a, of a, a part of the city of Toronto that has now been master planned and is being built out, where a community in, center in this case is being provided as a freestanding building with parks beside it, with uh, residential developments around it. But as the densities increase, how does that community get moved inside of, of the building? Um, how do we provide the, the kind of infrastructure that's required? In this case, we can provide allotment gardens as part of the uh, uh, larger plan for a community and, and, and uh, soft and hard space for playgrounds. But in some cases, um, we don't have the room to do that, and so how do we put that inside the buildings? This is, uh, speaking of the precinct plan idea, this is uh, the precinct plan for uh, Lower Young, which we've been involved with now for the last five years, and the two buildings, um, or the, the, this, these blocks right here are part of the development that we've just re recently got approved. But what was unique about this uh, entire precinct was that it was planned with all of the developers working together uh, with the city and with Waterfront Toronto to come up with a, a, a notion of where does the public space go and as opposed to each uh, developer providing a small park on his own uh, uh, space or own site, there was an approach where it was consolidated into one piece of uh, one of the developer's parcels, so it was taken out of his um, buildable area, but he was given additional density in other parts of the uh, development so that we could have a centralized park. And it was an agreement that was, come, uh, that was brought forward and through a whole process with the, uh, the city, the community, Waterfront Toronto, and all the developers acting in unison to create a, an entire community. So this idea of not just thinking of these singular iconic buildings, I think, kind of comes back into play. So community center is provided and co-located within the base of our building. There's the park, which is the central park. There's a daycare. There's a school that's provided in the base of the uh, adjacent developer's uh, building in his podium. There's office space that's part of this whole precinct plan. There's residential space. So it is this idea of complete community being created within a precinct of the uh, very close to the downtown. And so as the site plan was developed, we worked uh, to ensure that on the second floor of our development, uh, we could accommodate a 50,000 square foot uh, community center, which has uh, a six, um, six lane uh, swimming pool. It has a, a tennis, or sorry, a basketball court, uh, entire facilities for a community center, which are being programmed in the podium of the building. And so what happens is that the complexity of these buildings is just becoming even more uh, uh, challenging for all of us to work in. So this idea of uh, the community center uh, occupying the second floor, affordable housing occupying uh, the podium, uh, amenity space for the residents within the complex, and this kind of complex stacking that happens at the base of the residential tower helps to create uh, this community uh, within this location. And as then, then there are linkages back through to the city. There are linkages within the development that connect us to uh, some of the adjacent properties. There's retail at the base. There's uh, public open space that comes through and penetrates the base. But there is, again, this idea of this functioning with the community center and the affordable housing as part of a, a complete community component that's adding to the, the creation of the, uh, the One Young Precinct. As that manifests itself in the architecture, the uh, community center occupies the corner site on the base of the building facing the park. So we've modified the design so that we can accommodate and co-locate the community center 
uh, within the development, not something that you typically see in some of the earlier developments that are happening in the city, but now as the densities are increasing and families are moving downtown and this idea of creating a complete community that a, the family can live in this building, have access to the communi community center, which is located in the base of it, and then have access to the park adjacent is also an important uh, part of the planning that's going on in the city. The study also includes a whole series of case studies that look uh, internationally. This is Southeast False Creek. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, except to say that there's a lot of interesting and I think valuable research that has been done for this study that's accessible online but looks broadly uh, across the, uh, the world at different scales, different densities, different ways of uh, accommodating families within neighborhoods. At the building level, we've also studied uh, ways to accommodate families in terms of the unit design, in terms of uh, public spaces, in terms of amenity spaces that are located within the building. How do people get access to these amenity levels that are elevated? We've looked at ways of um, made recommendations about how public spaces like the lobbies within the buildings could be redesigned to accommodate uh, places where uh, kids can hang out, different ages, different generations can hang out, as well as having uh, uh, indoor and ex uh, exterior space as well that's accessible for families. Got a bit of a delay again. And we've provided some sketch uh, material also that, uh, as part of the study that looks at different ways of accommodating within uh, configurations of uh, tower and podium uh, layouts, pu uh, public spaces, privately owned public spaces as part of the ground floor plan, how lobbies can be configured, how storage could be provided uh, within the, uh, the typical floors to accommodate things like strollers and things that uh, spaces that families uh, would need to, to accommodate uh, storage. Uh, of, of some of their uh, things because the units are getting uh, smaller as we're finding in a lot of these buildings. Uh, allotment gardens that are provided on the uh, rooftops of some of the podiums so that there is generous access to exterior space as well. And the building case studies include uh, projects again all over the world. This one is in uh, New York via Verde. And then we went into the unit to look at how we could redesign or uh, uh, think about the, this whole issue of how do we provide storage for strollers, how do we improve sight lines, how, how do we accommodate spaces, uh, whether they're in uh, living rooms or in kitchens uh, to, to, to have families gather. How, how can we take something that is typically stuck in a closet, the laundry, uh, and provide just a bit more space uh, for storage of uh, uh, a sink and for uh, just um, things that you need to do laundry to take care of families and to uh, improve living conditions. And then this idea of within something like a kitchen, providing built-in areas for kids as well. And bedrooms, we've looked at different um, ideas of how bedrooms can be configured, how we can use uh, furniture to uh, accommodate different stages of life uh, as well. The notion of providing possibly flexibility within the layout of a, of a unit. How can we divide, set up a unit infrastructure that would allow a family to grow from needing one bedroom to two bedrooms to possibly three bedrooms and how that could be accommodated. And um, also, uh, case studies are provided for the units within the, uh, the study as well. This is uh, one of the projects in the uh, City of Toronto. Uh, that looked at different ways of configuring units, stacking units, not just having single loaded corridors, but skip, stop uh, corridor layouts, uh, and actually using the corridors as um, uh, slightly wider spaces to accommodate kids playing or people uh, actually using it for more than just circulation. All of this is in an attempt to um, uh, assist the city, I think, as it goes through the uh, TO core planning process of trying to consolidate a lot of the different urban design guidelines and to create a plan, an official plan for the City of Toronto as we move forward and we try to accommodate the growth and the uh, density that we've, uh, that, that we've been seeing. And these are slides taken from the City's uh, presentation, which is actually a very interesting presentation to see. But the idea of complete communities, connect connectivity, uh, prosperity, diversity, 
uh, resiliency and responsibility, all key things that are part of the, uh, the objective of the TO port.